The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. We are here this morning to hear the word of God. We are currently in the middle of a study on major Bible themes, and that study on major Bible themes is based upon a book that was originally written by Lewis Berry Chafer and then modified by Walbert. And it's an excellent book that talks about 52 different topics of the scriptures that are important for us to understand. It connects very well with our Thursday night doctrinal tenets class. It lines up and many of the same things are being taught and reinforced in the doctrinal tenets class. But we are taking a little bit of an aside. And you'll notice the slideshow looks different. It's a different... Uh, theme, if you will, on the slideshow. And the reason for that is this is not a topic that is drawn from the book, the book written by Chafer and then revised by Walver. This is a topic, though, that is important. It is a major Bible theme. So we're including it in our study of major Bible themes, but it is a little bit of an aside because it's not derived from the book itself. We're doing a study of spiritual gifts. And the term that I've used here is a surpassing grace empowerment for believers, and we're going to talk about what that means in terms of a surpassing grace empowerment for believers. Now, before we begin this study, let's take a moment for silent prayer. Let's make sure that, in fact, our hearts are prepared. Now, what does that mean? Hopefully, we're not uh, in a state of sin at the moment, that we haven't committed any sins just in the past few minutes. I hope my singing didn't do that to you. But uh, if you are in sin, this is an opportunity to confess your sins and be filled with the Holy Spirit. But If you're already in fellowship, which I pray that you are, I pray that our singing of the hymns was done in fellowship and for the glory of the Lord. But if uh, you are in fellowship, take this time to get your thoughts focused. Take this time to ask the Lord to help you have understanding. Take this time to yield yourself in humility to the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have given us your word, that we have the opportunity to spend time studying your word, that we are richly blessed by your word, that through knowing you, by studying your word, we come to know you, and in knowing you, we have peace, we have comfort, we have joy. So many things are available to us. And Father, when I think of the moment of our salvation, the moment that we placed our faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, and received that free gift, Father, we know we can't earn our salvation. We can't do anything to be saved. But by faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, we were blessed, and we were blessed abundantly. So many grace gifts were poured out upon us. And one of the things that took place at that moment of faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, was that we received at least one spiritual gift. And Father, as we study this topic, I pray that you would help us all to understand what is being taught, that this message will be well received, and that each and every one of us would be urged on to consider what our giftedness might be, that we would know that because you've given us this gift, you have a purpose for it that there are ministries available to utilize the giftedness. And Father, I ask that you would help us to become oriented that way, that we would begin begin more and more to become oriented to those things that you've given to us and how you want us to use them, what your plan is, what is the race that's been set before us. And as we study on these spiritual gifts, Father, I ask that you would give us clarity about our own giftedness over time. It may not happen right away, but over time, we would begin to understand our giftedness. Father, and I pray these things in Jesus Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen. Now, we've been here as a church uh, for almost three years now. It was in November of it was in November of 2009, November 15th, in fact, of 2009, that Lost Pines Bible Church was established. And that was uh, the beginning of this local church. We were a Bible study previous to that, a local Bible study here in the area. So we haven't quite been here for three years yet. 
Uh, it was almost a year to the day before that that I was ordained. On November 14th of 2008, I was ordained at Austin Bible Church. And then one year later, this church was established. So we have not been here three years. And this is a topic that has only been briefly discussed in the, the skirts, if you will. We've just skirted on it and just touched the edge of it. We haven't really gotten to the core of studying on spiritual gifts. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The closest we came to an all-out uh, class talking about this was a class that Ty taught. Ty taught a class on one of the spiritual gifts, and we'll get to that later. But that's really the closest we've come to having a class on this. Part of the reason for the delay, if you will, on teaching on this is that the Lord really did not put it upon my heart to teach on this until uh, recently, and also because this is a study that can be somewhat uh, controversial. I will be teaching this from the Scriptures, and I will be teaching this with confidence that what I'm teaching you is biblical, and uh, I have good reason for that. But you may have been taught something different when it comes to spiritual gifts, and if that, that's okay, I ask if you've been taught something different that you listen to what we're going to teach here, and if you have a difference on that, I will tell you this, that having a difference of opinion on spiritual giftedness is not a uh, grounds for parting ways. In other words, we should not have a difference of opinion on spiritual gifts that cause us to not be able to have fellowship one with another. But this is a topic that has a lot of, uh, a lot of controversy in the church. And uh, I will tell you ahead of time that one of the things that took place at Austin Bible Church when I was there and I was in my preparation for uh, my ordination and preparation for being a pastor of a church is that not only did we have multiple classes where we were going through and learning about the spiritual gifts, but in addition, we went through verse by verse, and I'm talking about in detail, verse by verse through 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14. And I'm here to tell you right now, if you want to understand spiritual gifts, you need to go through 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14 in detail. And that those three chapters are about spiritual giftedness. Now tell me what's in that, in that context. Right in the middle of it, what's in that context? The great passage on love. And it is in context with the teaching Paul did on spiritual gifts. What I'm here to tell you right now is everything we're going to learn about spiritual gifts, if these are not used in the sphere of love, they're useless. All of this must be done in love. All of this must be done in love. Spiritual gifts are used for the body of Christ and they're done in love. Now what I can tell you is that teaching out of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 was so powerful that there was a pastor who was uh, part of an Assembly of God church and he got Pastor Bob's notes on 1 Corinthians because he wanted to teach 1 Corinthians verse by verse to his congregation. And he went through the materials and he used it as a, as a basis, but he did his own study. And when it was all said and done, he left the Assembly of God Church because he knew that their doctrines didn't line up with the Scriptures. After having gone through 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, line upon line, precept upon precept, it was so clear to that pastor that he left the Assembly of God Church. So you will see that what I'm going to... And I'm not going to be able to go in that kind of detail. Pastor Bob taught close to 700 classes on the book of 1 Corinthians. That shows you the kind of detail he was teaching it on. We're not going to go into that kind of detail, but what I will tell you is what I'm here to teach you about spiritual gifts is based on study of that kind of detail. This is not a class where we dig into that level of detail, but what I'm teaching you is based on that level of detail. Well, let's take a look at this. Hopefully you have notes. By the way, I have a sheet up here that I'm going to hand out when we're done. And what it is, is it's just a, a one-sheeter that has a list of the, of the gifts that we're going to talk about in this class. And it also has another section that talks about, uh, we'll get to this later, consideration, conviction, and confirmation of giftedness. And so that's a one-sheeter, so you can take that with you and you can use it to help you try to understand what your giftedness is. But I'm going to hand that out at the end of the class. At first, we're going to start talking about Old Testament spiritual gifts because spiritual gifts is a context we understand in the church. We're given spiritual gifts, and it's universal. Everyone receives at least one gift. We'll talk about that more. 
But believe it or not, spiritual gifts were actually given prior to the dispensation of the church. These spiritual gifts were a surpassing grace empowerment. And I'll explain that term here in a moment. From God, but they were not given to all believers. And some would even call this, you know, that they would have this giftedness given to them and they would even have an, I think the term is endowment, right? Isn't that what, an endowment given of the Holy Spirit and then the giftedness. And it was a temporary nature. These were of a temporary nature. Now, the, what I mean by surpassing grace empowerment, in particular, that term is important for us in the church. Because I want you to think about this for a second. At the moment of your salvation, God poured out grace blessings beyond belief. And we did a study on that called Salvation Grace Blessings. And there's other people that, that have done uh, studies on that and called it something different. But it has to do with all the things that you received at the moment of your salvation. And one of those things was the indwelling Holy Spirit. Every born-again believer in Jesus Christ is indwelled with the Holy Spirit. We are a temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells within us. We then have empowerment that the previous dispensations did not. You are, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you are empowered by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Your study of the scriptures, as you look at the Jewish dispensation, the Israelites, they did not have the universal indwelling. So they were operating in a whole different construct and they didn't have the empowerment that you have. So we are already at a level of empowerment by having the indwelling Holy Spirit that's greater than what the Israelites had. Now, some of them would receive a temporary endowment of the Holy Spirit and they would be empowered by that and they were able to do things that were superhuman in some ways. You think about Samson and some of the things he was able to do and so on. David was blessed with a, something of a permanent. He had it pretty much for his, his whole life, his whole time in, in service as the king. He, he had the Holy Spirit, but that's not, that was not universal pre previously. So you already have an empowerment that's above and beyond them. Just because you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ in the church, you have an empowerment. Um, but by the way, guess what comes with that? Responsibility and accountability. That's exactly right. So uh, to whom much is given, much is required. So since we have a greater empowerment, we are actually, to do, actually asked to do even more, and we're held accountable to a higher standard. All right, so you already have a high level of empowerment. Now, what this giftedness is that we're going to be studying about is surpassing empowerment. It's something that is even greater than what you already have. And we'll get to that when we talk about the gifts for us today. So this is a surpassing. It surpasses the empowerment that everyone else has. So if you have a particular gift, then you have a surpassing empowerment above and beyond what an ordinary believer would have. But recognize Every believer has empowerment from God. Don't think because you don't have a particular gift that you're not empowered in that area. You are, just not to the extent that somebody would be with that gift. Craftsmen were gifted for the construction of the tabernacle. We'll take a look at some of these and also the temple. Let's take a look at, uh, you have all the scriptures there in your notes, but we'll just take a look at the uh, Exodus 31 passage. Exodus 31 verses 1 through 11. Oops, mistype. The skilled craftsman. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom. You see this? This is the message. This is the, that endowment we were talking about. I have filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom in understanding, in knowledge, and in all kinds of craftsmanship to make artistic designs for work in gold, in silver, and in bronze, and in the cutting of stones for settings, and in the carving of wood, that he may work in all kinds of craftsmanship. And behold, I myself have appointed him, excuse me, appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all who are skillful, I have put skill that they may make all that I have commanded them. You see what's done here. God is doing this. He is manifesting in them the ability to do these things, to make the tabernacle. So He's given them this ability. This is a giftedness. It goes on from here to say, The tent of meeting, the ark of, the test the ark of testimony, and the mercy seat upon it, and all the furniture of the tent, that is the tabernacle, the table also and its utensil utensils, and the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils, and the altar of incense, 
the altar of burnt offering also with all its utensils and the laver in its stand, the woven garments as well and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons with which to carry on their priesthood, the anointing oil also and the fragrant incense for the holy place. They are to make them according to all that I have commanded you. So God laid out this, this in, these instructions for the tabernacle and they were very detailed and they were very, it was a high order, right? This request that was being made for this tabernacle was a very high order because it was amazing what they were going to be able to do for this construction. But what did God do? He provided gifted men who were then able to do the construction and carry out exactly what had been commanded. So this is a spiritual giftedness of these uh, Old Testament saints. You'll see that also in 35, 30 through 35, and in chapter 36 of Exodus 1, verses 1 and 2 and 8. And then also of the temple itself, we have uh, 1 Kings 7, 14, and then 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verses 7, and also 13 and 14. We'll look at the 2 Chronicles passage, 2 Chronicles 2, verses, what did I do, is that right, 7, and then 13 and 14. It says here in this verse, Now send me a skilled man to work in gold, silver, brass, and iron, and in purple, crimson, and violet fabrics. And who knows how to make the engravings to work with the skilled men whom I have in Judah and Jerusalem, whom David, my father, provided. We get down to verses 13 and 14. It says, Now I am sending Huram Avi, a skilled man endowed with understanding. See the description there? Endowed with understanding. The son of a Danite woman and a Tyrian father who knows how to work in gold, silver, bronze, iron, stone, and wood, and in purple, violet, linen, and crimson fabrics, and who knows how to make all kinds of engravings and to execute any design which may be assigned to him to work with your skilled men and with those of my Lord David, your father. So here we see the idea of he's been endowed with understanding. A skilled man has been given an endowment of understanding. This is a giftedness. God provided these abilities to these individuals for the construction of the tabernacle or tent, as it's described there, and also the temple. So these, this is a giftedness that preceded the dispensation of the church. Now, prophets were also gifted and sent to Israel. They were given gifts as well. In Jeremiah 7.25 We'll take a look at these Jeremiah passages here if you want to turn with me there. I didn't give you time earlier, but if you want to turn in your Bibles or you can follow on the screen either way. Jeremiah, we're going to start in chapter 7, verse 25. These are the prophets. Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have sent you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising early and sending them. So these are prophets. They were gifted men. Uh, 25.4, Jeremiah 25.4, if you want to turn there with me also. Here is talking about, well, Jeremiah had a tough ministry, right? We recognize that. He had a tough ministry because he was trying to tell the people, look, uh, the Lord's trying to tell you something, but you're not listening. And, and over and over and again, over again, they didn't listen. They were very stubborn. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, you think about it. We're a small church. You know, I come up here and I preach the Word, and it's a small gathering here. But you've got to realize for Jeremiah, I always looked at Jeremiah and think, you know, he had to sit there and preach, and really no one wanted to hear what he had to say. I mean, at least I can look out at your smiling faces and I know you're loving hearing the Word of God and you're enjoying the teaching, but Jeremiah, I mean, pretty much he had to sit there and keep on preaching and nobody really wanted to hear what he had to say. And here he says in 25.4, he says, And the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, again and again, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear, saying, Turn now everyone from his evil way and from the evil of your deeds and dwell on the land which the Lord has given you given to you, I should say, and your forefathers forever and ever. But they wouldn't listen, right? They would not listen because they were still going after other gods and they were worshiping other gods and they were provoking the Lord to anger. Well, there's the message. We could go look at some more, but these, this is the idea that these prophets were sent and these were gifted men. They were gifted with the gift of prophecy. And also, by the way, they were sent to the Gentiles. Jonah chapter 3 in verses 1 through 5. Jonah chapter 3. Again, you can look on the screen or you can turn there with me if you'd like. To Jonah 
chapter 3. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. Now, we know the story of Jonah, right? This, <laughs> he didn't exactly go the first time he was asked, but he eventually went, right? Go to Nineveh. And so in verse 3, we see Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. It was also a Gentile empire, part of a Gentile empire. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, go through the city one day's walk, and he... Uh, cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Now, what's interesting about this whole story, and you can read more about it in additional scriptures in the Old Testament, is that Jonah was not happy about the idea of going and giving this message to the Gentiles. And he was even less happy, I can tell you, about the fact that they believed and they repented and turned to God. Now, you would think he would, he would like that, but... What was inherent there already in the Jewish people was a disdain for the Gentiles, a disdain that they was beyond what they, they... They should have looked at the unbelieving Gentiles and their activities and had disdain for that. But the truth is they were the stewards of the oracles of God and they were supposed to be going out and giving this message to the Gentiles. But the, this utter disdain had formed and he didn't like the idea of the Gentiles hearing the message and then it was even worse for him that they believed. But God was working through this anyway. Even though Jonah didn't exactly have the right heart, uh, the Lord was working through this and uh, the people were saved. Now what we see is that how long did it take before Nineveh fell into ruins? What's that? It wasn't much. It was less than 100 years for sure. It wasn't long before the people of Nineveh had fallen into apostasy and Nineveh was destroyed. But we see, you know, that's, that's by the way, just a little, little message on the side. I sent out an email to uh, to the folks on the church email list and and gave you some things to pray for during this political season and you notice none of that had to do with which uh, which candidate to pray for it was really more oriented towards the idea of uh, the spiritual health of this land and that's what we need to be praying for because our land is in spiritual disarray we are this nation is spiritually apostate it's just the truth we don't like to hear it but it's true we're in apostasy in the in the United States of America. And, you know, here Nineveh believed, and for some period of time they were under the blessing hand of God, right, under His hand of blessing. But what we see is that not very long after that they had fallen into apostasy and they were destroyed. So that could happen to the United States, folks. We are not promised anything. The people of Israel have covenant promises. The United States does not. Now, I believe in... Some of you know this language. I believe in the idea that the United States has been and to this day continues to be a client nation to God. I believe we are, but I think we could lose that status. I believe that uh, we turn our back on Israel, look out. If we stop being the nation that sends out missionaries to the entire world the way we do, look out. And uh, we are in decline as a nation. And so those prayers were oriented to that idea, praying for the spiritual health of this nation because it doesn't take long. I'll be honest with you guys. Um, and again, I'm not going to I'm not going to get political because uh, that's not for me to do from the pulpit. But uh, you know, you need to when you go to the polls on November the sixth, you need to vote according to you know what you know the scriptures have to say. Use what you know of the Word of God to help you decide how to vote. It's very important. Uh, but what I'll tell you is that um, I'm 53 years old. I could see. I could see what we see in our land today. I could see it coming. I've seen it for years now. I just can't believe how fast it's happened. I am utterly shocked at what has happened, how fast it's happened, how fast we have declined as a people. It's amazing to me. I could see it happening, you know, down the road after years and years. It is, it's amazing what is taking place in our country. So please be in prayer for our country or we're in trouble. Now, millennial spiritual gifts. We looked at Old Testament spiritual gifts. There, were, give, there was a giftedness given to the prophets. There was a giftedness given to the tabernacle builders, the temple builders. There's also going to be giftedness given in the millennium. And I'm touching on all these points because I'm hitting the different aspects of spiritual giftedness and then we'll get around to, at the end of this, the different excuse me, gifts that we need to consider. During the future millennial kingdom, the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all mankind 
and Jewish sons and daughters will prophesy. Let's go look at Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. Joel chapter 2. See if we can find Joel in our Bibles. It's definitely before the book of Matthew, right? It's, it's, it's in there in the Minor Prophets. Joel chapter 2. It says in verse 28, It will come about after this. And that's important. That's an important phrase. It will come about after this that I will pour out my Spirit on all mankind. And that's important language as well. And your, now who's being talked to by Joel? <laughs> He's talking to the Jewish people. He's talking to Israel. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. All right, so here we have a picture of the spirit being poured out on all of mankind. And it says something about here after this. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Peter referred to this Joel passage when describing the events of Pentecost. But this event at the inception of the church did not in any way fulfill the promises made to Israel. This is very important. Acts chapter 2. Verses 15 through 18. Probably do a little better job of finding the book of Acts, won't we? Yeah, we can get to that one we get to Romans, we've gone too far. If we're in the Gospels, we've got to go. Yeah, so you got it. Acts chapter 2 and verse 15. For these men are not drunk. See, here's what he's doing. They, they, they were accusing these men of what they were doing as being drunk. And he says, Peter says, No, for these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. Now, as you'll notice there, that's in their timeline, that was about 9 o'clock in the morning. I mean, I've actually, there are people who get drunk by 9 o'clock in the morning, but it's at least unusual, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. These guys weren't drunk. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. He's quoting the passage here. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and in the signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. And it goes on from there. But see, it's talking about, he says, this is what was spoken of. Now, you notice one of the things that's important is that there's not language here that says this is to fulfill what was spoken of through the prophet. That's very important that that language is not there because it was not a fulfillment of that. But it was what was spoken of in terms of the spirit being poured forth. It did not fulfill that. The future prophetic ministry of Jewish believers during the millennia must be distinguished from the gifts given to believers in the church today. Joel was talking about what is yet to come. Very important, very important. We will look at that on this table. You should have that in your notes. Everybody have the notes, by the way? Okay. Joel chapter 2, 28 and 29. After this follows the zealous deliverance of Israel from the Gentiles. The deliverance of Israel from the Gentiles. When is that going to be completely fulfilled? During the 70th week of Daniel, right? At, during that time period, you're going to have the complete fulfillment of that. At the end of that time period, you're going to have this take place, and it's going to be after that that this is going to take place. The Holy Spirit will be poured out on all mankind, right? Let me back up a second. Let me go to Acts 2, right across from that. No such event preceded the inception of the church. We did not have the deliverance of Israel from the Gentiles. There's no such thing. So this event was not preceded by the zealous deliverance of Israel from the Gentiles. Second column there, second row I should say there, first column, the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all mankind. That's what it says in Joel 2.28. If you look at what happened at, the, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out on a select group of believers in Jerusalem. And actually, as you read through the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is then poured out upon additional groups as you go through the period of time. You did not see. And even then, when all that was said and done, was the Holy Spirit poured out on all mankind? No, all of mankind did not receive the Holy Spirit. This is going to be fulfilled at Second Advent, and we'll talk about why that is, why it's different. The Jewish people, your sons and your daughters, will receive gifts of prophecy. That's dreams and visions, and that does take place uh, in the future. There actually is no mention of tongues. What we see here 
is the Spirit-filled church members begin to speak in tongues, but there's no mention of prophecy. That's not to say that there's not some prophecy that goes on in the early church, and we'll talk about that. But the fact of the matter is, it's a whole different event. Now, why do we look, if we look at the second row, why is this distinct? Because what's going to happen at the second advent is that you're going to have two things take place. Sheep and goats judgment, wilderness judgment. When you have the sheep and goats judgment, that's when you're going to have the judgment of the Gentiles. The judgment of the Gentiles, you're going to have all of the unbelieving Gentiles are going to be removed, taken away. The language we just read about, they'll be taken up. In the wilderness judgment, the Jewish people are judged, and you have those that are unbelieving Jews are taken out, taken out of the way. So when you begin the, the uh, millennial kingdom, right after, right after these judgments take place, when you begin the millennial kingdom, everybody on the face of the earth is a believer. And so the Holy Spirit can be poured out on all mankind. That's very important to understand. That's why this is not what was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 was a subset of the human race, the, born, the ones who believed, and this is the entire human race. There's a difference in terms of tongues coming out of this, and then we have no mention of, of uh, the prophecy here. We have no mention of tongues here. There's a distinction between the two. Is that clear? Does everybody see the difference between them? So when he said this was what was spoken of, what he is saying is, is, remember what we know from the Scriptures about the Holy Spirit being poured out? That's what's happening here. These individuals aren't drunk. The Holy Spirit is being poured out upon them, and that's what's taking place. And so that's what Peter was teaching in Acts chapter 2, is the picture of the, the events unfolding as described in Joel, but not a fulfillment of that prophecy, because that will be fulfilled yet future. Now we get to the spiritual gifts for the church. This is just in general about the spiritual gifts for the church. Is everybody clear on the difference between Joel and Acts? I want to make sure we're clear on the difference between what's going to happen at the second advent and what happened at Pentecost. Everybody's good. Okay. Spiritual gifts for the church. Every believer in the dispensation of the church receives at least one spiritual gift. I'm absolutely convinced of that. 1 Peter 4.10 makes it clear. 1 Peter 4.10. We haven't gotten there yet in our study of 1 Peter. We're almost there, though, aren't we? We're in 1 Peter chapter 4, but we haven't quite gotten here yet. Verse 10, it says, As each one has received a... They added the word special there, but as each one has received a gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now, he's he's saying each one has received a gift. He's declaring it to be so. Now, some would take this and use this to say that individuals in the church receive one gift and only one gift. I don't think you can use this passage to say this. What this says is each person has received a gift, but you might have received more than one. All this passage says is you've received a gift. Everyone has been gifted. As part of the church. This is not exclusionary. This is talking to everybody. Everyone has received a gift. Each one has received a gift. So everybody has. You, you, you as a born again believer. Have at least one spiritual gift. As it, we just saw in that passage. Spiritual gifts should be employed in serving others. Whoops. I got a little problem there. Sorry. Should be employed in serving others. As stewards of the manifold grace of God. These gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. Ministries are allotted by Jesus Christ, and all of the effects are produced by the Father. Now, maybe you haven't had this teaching before, but this was, again, as we went verse by verse through 1 Corinthians chapter 12, this was abundantly clear. Let's turn there now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, remember, this is a spiritual gifts passage, verses 4 through 6. 1 Corinthians 4, excuse me, 12, verses 4 through 6. I'd never, I'd never been taught this before, so it was really cool to learn this. It says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God, and that's speaking of God the Father there, who works all things in all persons. And so this is a passage, actually, if you spend time in the, in the Greek behind this, you will see the gifts... Are administered by the Spirit. He's the one who gives out the, the gifts. Ministries given by the Lord. Did you know that? That your ministries are actually given out by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who assigns ministries to you. 
There are varieties of effects, the same God the Father who works all things in all persons. And so in other words, whatever giftedness you have came from the, the Holy Spirit, whatever doors of ministry open up, those are given to you by the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever fruit you bear, whatever effects there are of that ministry, it's not you who did it. It's God the Father who produces the effects. He's the one who works all things in all persons. And so God the, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all involved in this process. And it's laid out for you right there. Boom, boom, boom. Another Trinitarian passage. Last hour we were talking about uh, Trinitarian passages. We saw one in Revelation and here's one in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But this is a beautiful thing to think about. So at the moment of your salvation, the Holy Spirit gave you at least one gift. Throughout your Christian walk, you will have doors of ministry opened for you. The Lord Jesus Christ does that. And then when you engage in ministry, any effects that are produced, any fruit that's born is brought about through the working of God the Father, which is, which is fascinating. This is something worth considering because a lot of people believe that after the Father working through the Son, as we know, after He completed the process of creation and He put forth the plan of salvation and He did all of these things, that now the Father is basically, uh, He's kicked back, He's got Himself a little throne room and He sits up there and He's kind of resting just watching his son do what he's doing, and he's watching the Holy Spirit doing all those things, and the father is just kind of in uh, idle mode. It's not true. This is a passage you can turn to. It is the father who is working things in you. He is at work in you, right? And we have other passages that, that talk to that as well. In fact, this probably references some of them, right? The, uh, I'm trying to think of the one passage. But it, yeah, it's talking about God being over all and all. But there's a passage that talks about He's uh, working within you to bring about His His good His good pleasure, basically. So the idea is that God the Father is at work. God the Father is at work in us as we perform the ministry. So hopefully you understand the distinction there. The Holy Spirit gives us these gifts at the moment of our salvation for the common good. That was the very next verse. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, I would go beyond that and say not only the giftedness that's mentioned in this passage, the Holy Spirit that you have indwelling you from the beginning of your, your new birth was given to you for the common good. Now, what is the point of that? It's not actually given to you so that you can go exalt yourself. You don't have the giftedness, uh, the spiritual giftedness, and you don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit so you can exalt yourself. The point of these gifts is that you would serve others. It's for the common good. It's so that my, the giftedness that I have is so that I can build you up. The giftedness that you have is so that you can build me and others up. We're all here to build one another up. That's the point of all of this. That's the purpose of the giftedness. That's the purpose of the giving of the manifestation of the Spirit in the building up of the body of Christ, which is what I just mentioned. We get to that in 1 Corinthians 14, 26b. Turn there with me, if you will. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. It says here, what is the outcome then? And this is after, by the way, this long three-chapter discussion of spiritual gifts. What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Right? So we'll, and we'll talk more about all these different aspects, but let all things be done for edification. Whatever we're doing, whatever it is, we're building up one another. And that's why last Sunday, you know, I gave a, an exhortation. And I, I kind of was concerned that maybe I, maybe I scared all of you off or something because the place emptied out really fast last Sunday. So I thought, wow, I gave an exhortation on gossip and the place just emptied out. I must have touched, touched some people, uh, made them angry or something. But the point is that what does gossip do? Gossip actually tears people down, right? Gossip, as we talk about others, as we cut other people down, we're tearing them down. And God is in the building business. He's in the business of building others up. So whatever you're doing in terms of your ministries for the Lord, it should be done for edification. And that's, that's inside and outside the local church, by the way. So inside the church, whatever we do, every, every, and it means everything. It means everything from 
the one who's the, the, your, the, your idiot pastor who stands up here and preaches the word. It means the people who take care of the nursery. It means the people who mow the lawn. It means whatever it is, it's done for the Lord and ultimately is for building up the body of Christ. That's the whole purpose. For example, I'll give you a simple example. The one who works in the nursery and takes care of the little ones allows someone else to sit here in the auditorium and hear the Word of God being taught. It's for the building up. That's the whole purpose of that ministry is that, that others would be built up. And it's that heart of a servant attitude that others would be built up. That's the whole purpose of our giftedness. All right, so these are all general general ideas. You have at least one gift. They should be used in serving others. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit giving the gifts, Jesus Christ with the ministries, God the Father with the effects. And the idea is that you've received this gift. It's for the common good to build up the body of Christ. So as, you, as we go through the gifts, understand that that's the overall picture of what we're talking about. Now, I, I don't know if I want to go ahead. I guess I'll go ahead. And, now, you know what? I'm going to hold off. We're going to come back to this next time. We're going to come back to this next time. I've got, a, I've got something I want to talk about here at the end of class uh, before we close, but we'll come back to this next time. And what we're going to do is we're going to break out and we're going to talk about spiritual gifts that were part of the apostolic age. There, many of you weren't here for this, but as we studied the in major Bible themes, as we studied the dispensations in the ages, we looked at the different dispensations and how they were broken down into different ages. For example, in the Jewish dispensation, when the Jews were the stewards of God on earth, there were different ages. There was the age of promise. There was the age of law. There's going to be an age, uh, an age of tribulation yet future. There was the age of the incarnation when Christ was here. Recognize that when the Christ came, we were still under a Jewish stewardship at that time. So the, there was a, the age of the incarnation. Then we have yet the age of tribulation and then the age of the millennial kingdom. All of these things are part of the Jewish dispensation. In the church age itself, primarily it's broken down just into two different ages. You have the apostolic age, which was during the time the apostles were on earth, the foundation of the church. And then you have the age of the local church. That's one thing we've been learning about, by the way, in Revelation is that as the revelation was given to the Apostle John there on Patmos, when he received that information, he was then doing something totally different in terms of delivering a message that would then be delivered to the pastors of the local churches that would then be delivered to the churches. And it was basically the handing over, it was the handing over of the, um, the authority, if you will, for the local churches to the local pastors. In other words, under the... Uh, apostles, you had a period of time where, yes, you had individual local churches and there were individual pastors, but they were, on the, they were under the umbrella of the apostles. The apostles who had established those churches would still oversee at a higher level. But in the very beginning of the book of Revelation, we see that whole thing handed off. And we see this imagery of the, the messenger being held in the right hand of Jesus Christ. And the way the message was delivered from, uh, from God through the angels to John, to the pastors of the local churches, and then to those churches indicates this handing off of the authority to the local church. So we now are in the dispensation of the church, age of the local church, and it's a different age within the time of the church. When we come back next week, Lord willing, we're going to take a look at the apostolic age and the spiritual giftedness that were, was around in the apostolic age that is not still with us today. It's in your notes. You can take a look at it, but we will be studying this next Sunday, Lord willing, rapture pending. But before we go there, before we close the class, I do want to talk to you about something. One of the things that's really cool concept, and I thought of this uh, yesterday in terms of the picnic that we had. We had a picnic yesterday, and one of the things, this was something prompted actually by a conversation uh, that I had with, I had already intended to talk about these kinds of things, but then Ty came up and talked to me after class, and he was talking about how the picnic and the fellowship that we had with the saints yesterday just lifted him up. I mean, his soul was happy because of the time he was able to spend with his brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we were, and we were playing a, a game. We were playing cranium, and it was, you know, we were just sitting around having fun playing cranium, and yet our souls and our spirits were lifted up through the fellowship of the saints. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 
1 Corinthians chapter 16. You'll see where this is going. We're going to look at a few passages and then I'll talk to you about this. And start in verse 17 there. And Paul writes here, I rejoice over the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus because they have supplied what was lacking on your part, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge such men. Now Paul uses this language, the idea of a refreshment. Refreshment. Now, uh, yesterday at the picnic I was refreshed. And it had nothing to do with the tea that I was drinking. And admittedly, that was a refreshment, but this is talking about a spiritual refreshment. I was refreshed. If we turn in our Bibles also to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 13. Second Corinthians 7 and verse 13. It says here, For this reason... We have been comforted. And besides our comfort, we rejoiced even much more over the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. So here's, here Paul is not talking about his own refreshment. He's talking about Titus, right? He had sent Titus and Titus, his spirit had been refreshed by all of them. What a joy that Titus had been able to have his spirit refreshed. Oops, sorry. If we take a look also... At 2 Timothy 1.16, 2 Timothy 1.16, good news is it's easy to find because all of our tea books are right there together in our Bibles. You hit one of them, you've found them. It says here, the Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus because... For he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Now, this is actually talking about Paul being imprisoned, right? He was bound. He was imprisoned. And yet, this individual was not ashamed of his chains. He was not ashamed at all. And so, Onesiphorus would come and refresh Paul. And believe it or not, there's a, there's a, there's a refreshment that just takes place in the fellowship of the saints. That's where I'm going with this. I mean, often I talked to my mom last night. I talked to my mom. She's a believer. And even though she's my earthly mom, she's also my sister in Christ. And we talked on the phone. And she said, boy, I'm glad I talked to you tonight. I really needed this. And she was spiritually refreshed from the conversation. We have opportunities to give refreshment to one another. You need to realize that. As you, whoops, I'm sorry. I keep doing that. Turn with me finally to Philemon, the book of Philemon. And we'll look at verse 7 and verse 20 in the book of Philemon. It says, For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. So here now we're not talking about Titus, and here, here now we're not talking about Paul, but we're talking about the hearts of the saints having been refreshed through you, brother. And if you'll turn down with me also to verse 20. It says in verse 19, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, it says in verse 20, Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. So all of these refreshment passages, by the way, they're not talking about drinking a, a soda or having an iced tea or anything else, you know, whatever your favorite beverage is. It's a word that's weird for me to say. I was on an airplane one time, and this flight attendant was coming through, and she kept saying, beverage? Beverage? And I kept wanting to raise my hand. I'm right here, <laughs> right here, uh, but I didn't do it. But uh, anyway, so this idea of refreshment, this idea of refreshment, uh, I hope you know what I'm talking about. I hope you understand this. What I want to tell you is, no, we didn't have a picnic yesterday where we went outside and we played volleyball. No, we didn't play horseshoes. No, we didn't do any of the things that we normally do as a picnic, but I was refreshed. And let me tell you, that's an amazing thing and an awesome thing. I was refreshed. I'm refreshed when we have opportunities to get together and talk to one another. But here's what I want you to realize. You need to keep this in mind. 
when you go up and you interact with a fellow believer, you can either refresh them or they can walk away needing refreshment. Because if we go up to them in carnality, if we go up to them and we are tearing them down, if we go up and we are not operating in the sphere of love, remember earlier I talked about the sphere of love? If we're not operating in the sphere of love, we can actually leave them needing refreshment when we get done talking with them. But we have the opportunity. This is so important to understand. We have the opportunity to be a refreshment. You, think about that for a second. You have an opportunity to refresh everyone you see in this room. As you talk with them, you can bring them spiritual refreshment. Yesterday was a spiritual refreshment for me, much needed. It was much needed. I walked out of here yesterday exhausted and refreshed. Does that make sense? It's true. I was physically exhausted but I was spiritually refreshed. So remember, the thing I wanted you to walk away with is remember that you have that opportunity. You might be the refreshment. You might be able to refresh the saints. You might be able to refresh somebody you talk to one-on-one, like with my mother, my mother last night. You have an opportunity to supply spiritual refreshment. Now, where does that come from? From the Holy Spirit and from God. That's exactly right. The way we can refresh others is when we are indeed manifesting the love and the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? That's how it comes about. And so we want to recognize that it's of God that we're able to do these things. But refreshment is an important thing. We need, all of us, all of us need spiritual refreshment. We all need it. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and how powerfully it speaks to us and i thank you so much for the spiritual refreshment that i received yesterday again i pray uh, for this message on spiritual giftedness that if the individuals have a different understanding of this they, they might listen to the teaching here on spiritual gifts and will consider it and uh, father i pray that if there is a different understanding on giftedness that it will not be a a stumbling block it will not be something that causes a parting of ways because this is not a topic that should cause that if we differ on salvation that's pretty important father if we have a different understanding of how we're how uh, we have admittance into heaven that's a very important topic but spiritual gifts is something that we need to understand as something that's been provided and if there's a different understanding about uh, a detail here and there we should be able to show grace and to be relaxed about it father so i just pray that everybody is able to learn from these things and able to grow through these things and it will not cause any kind of contention or any kind of stumbling block father thank you so much for all your grace that's been poured out upon us thank you for these believers who made it a priority to be here this morning and thank you just for the way that they bring me joy as i look around the room and i see their faces i have true joy in my heart and i thank you for the way that works i thank you for how your plan works that in this body of believers that we function together and we lift one another up and we build one another up and it's all part of your glorious and magnificent plan so father i pray that you'll work in our hearts to help each and every one of us do what we do for your glory that we would be pleasing in your sight and that we would indeed shine that love and that grace of our savior jesus christ so that this lost and dying world can see and father i pray for opportunities to tell people about jesus christ bring the lost to us that we might be able to speak of Him. Father, we need a revival in this land. We need a spiritual revival in the worst way. And I pray for, along those lines, I pray for the pastors of the churches around this land that they will teach Your Word faithfully. And I pray that believers in this land would be convicted and turn back to You. Father, I pray that also for, for pastors and believers around the world. Thank You so much that we were able to study Your Word today, Father. We don't know how much longer we'll have on this earth. We don't know how much longer we'll be able to spend time uh, serving you in this, in this particular environment we're in right now. But we thank you that you gave us one more day today and one more opportunity to spend time in your word. And we thank you in Jesus Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen.